Hey, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. We're really excited to do our national sign-up webinar today. Um, so my name is Jenny Cull. I'm VP of Community Engagement for Help Seeker. And uh, presenting in today's webinar are our uh, Help Seekers fearless leaders. There's Dr. Lena Turner and Travis Turner. And as well as our Help Seekers Systems Mapper Coordinator Extraordinaire, Nicole Croft. So, um, in today's webinar, we're going to discuss the importance of systems mapping and why it's really uh, important to have active participation by um, service providers. And so we'll be doing a bit of a guided tour of the platform, as well as um, kind of teach you how to sign in and claim your uh, profiles and how to edit your profile when you need to. And then we'll kind of discuss how it all ties in together uh, for a successful community response. So without further ado, I'll pass it on over to Alina. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. So um, we thought it might be great to give you guys an overview about why this is all important. And the premise is, of course, that we're all amidst this intense crisis around COVID, yet we need to develop a, a really smart and swift way to, to respond really quickly. So just like you guys, we're, we're all in this together and making things up as we go along. So we're not pretending to, uh, to be any more experts than you are. Um, but what we thought we would do today is give you some context for why systems mapping is, is important in this work and the COVID work. And then for those of you who don't know uh, much about Help Seeker, just to give you the, the 101. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time because that's not what this is about. Uh, but here's the gist about us. So social enterprise, we do work in the technology space, the research and strategy community engagement space. So 25 folks that span um, our team in different areas of expertise. And we tend to uh, work with uh, funders or government, but also service providers on the ground. So we're, we're kind of in between all of these spaces. And, um, you know, our whole mission is to, you know, help unleash social innovation to um, make the complex social issues that we have tackled in, a, in more um, innovative and efficient ways or effective ways, I should say. Um, we also had a, a thing about disruption, systems disruption, because we, you know, we're, we're all about that too. Um, but we always say, or we have been saying, COVID has been the system disruptor. So now it's how do we um, harness it for the social good as best we can while uh, not losing sight of the, the greater good goals that we all share. So uh, next slide, please. Um, for those of you that have come to our previous webinars, this should be familiar, but those of you that haven't, uh, obviously you are experiencing this on the ground and just to uh, Ray, we kind of emphasize that this, these social needs across Canadian communities are still very much apparent and COVID, if anything, has really amplified them further and given them a very um, dynamic twist, as you will shortly see. Next slide, please. When we look at uh, responding to um, social issues, we look at them through a Kind of a holistic lens and uh, we look at well-being as something that includes these key dimensions that range from income and employment so those basic needs but also uh, spirituality and culture or even our um, relationship with the environment and nature so there's there's all of these components to a person or a community's well-being and so therefore when we build public systems or nonprofit systems and services they should also um, show these connections similarly. And the reason why we want to bring this lens into the COVID response is because we, we often tend to focus on only one aspect of, um, of their social response. And, and in COVID, this is very much driven by the health response, absolutely relevant. However, uh, we also know that mental health, that our uh, ability to connect with one another our ability to have meaning in life, these are all so interconnected that uh, the social safety net has a critical role to play um, to ensure that we have a swift uh, recovery as we move through this crisis. So a couple of uh, points if you don't have a social response, why this is such a, a critical piece to have in your community. Um, if you 
if you're not engaged in one already, but I think lots of you are. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, there we go. So those of you that are uh, developing COVID social responses, this is what we've heard is working well. And you can see within this where systems mapping fits in, which is gonna be the, the focus of today's discussion. So the coordination infrastructure, your ability to respond to needs in real time. So back in the day, we had the luxury of year long studies to understand needs. Now we have to do it um, on a daily basis or weekly basis. So the, the way we do this work is much, much more dynamic. Systems mapping, so those of you that don't know what systems mapping is, it's understanding your social safety nets assets and the relationships between, among them. And, and you'll see in a second what that means in practice. And then of course, there's all the dimensions of a coordinated response that are needed. So engaging civil society, so that's much more than charities and nonprofit sector. That's your business community, that's your uh, volunteers and your faith sector, informal grassroots groups that might have traditionally not been engaged in social responses, but are now wanting to lend a hand. So mechanisms to mobilize civil society and harness it towards uh, common priorities is, is quite critical. Your tech stack, so how are you keeping track of these components? And you're here about help seekers platform as part of the tech stack, but we, we always say we're only one tool in the toolbox. Uh, there's lots of communication uh, tools and client information management systems that tend to come together when, when this type of um, initiative takes hold in a community. And then public engagement, of course, getting your community to know what's happening in terms of your social response and engaging them to play an active role within it. And of course, real-time monitoring and agility because this is changing so quickly that um, you know what worked last week is ne not necessarily what's going to work this week. And I have tons of examples of what we were introducing in week one is now uh, irrelevant. So uh, that agile monitoring is very, very important. Next slide, please. Um, a couple of things too, we've promised to uh, give you guys up-to-date information of what, about what we're seeing in our platform. So these are um, the interactions around uh, Canada-wide data that we have seen in relation to, um, to COVID. So we just pulled the top five needs interactions out of the platform um, are just an FYI that the interactions in, on Help Seeker nationally doubled um, in just the last 30 days compared to previous months. So um, definitely we see additional traffic and it's primarily driven by people looking for COVID related services. So not surprisingly, health is a big one, but as you can see there, addiction, abuse, mental health and domestic violence. Interestingly, and you'll see it in a second, um, when we looked at pull the data last week, the number one and two um, searches were actually for food and housing. So, you know, just in one week, things have shifted. And it's not that housing and food are not on the top on the radar. They absolutely are. They're just not the top um, any longer, which, again, it, it's telling you a part of the story. And what we're saying with this is you need to have an ability to pull data so you understand what the dynamics are and then look at data as um, as a tool in terms of your decision making and, and it can't just be one source. So you want to be looking at your unemployment stats coming out. You want to be looking at help seekers data. You also want to be looking at uh, shelter utilization, for instance, and food bank utilization to understand the full story. So not one data set, but and a combination of data sets to question, you know, what are we doing and is it making an impact, what's coming down the pipe that we need to prepare for. So this is just a, an, a caveat on, on any one data source. Next slide, please. Yeah, so there's um, the overview of the total data, uh, and this is just national. So one point here is that we have, um, whatever, 117,000 services across Canada. Um, but um, out of these, we have about 1,600 that are COVID specific. So anything that's COVID specific popped up 
in the last month, right? Since COVID, since March 16 is when we kind of made the call that this is really when COVID struck. So we've um, we've started mapping these COVID-related responses and have 1,600 up to up to now. But the thing about those is that they they come and go quite quickly. Um, and they shift quite quickly. So one week it was doing transportation and delivery for seniors. Now there, somebody has shifted to, um, you know, youth well-being checks or something like that. So you need to have a, a way of tracking this uh, really dynamically because they it's shifting so so quickly, and it's not your traditional player. So sometimes it's as you'll see from Nicole, it's it's all over the place in terms of who's pitching in. Oh, and I I'm sorry I lied to you guys. I said it's twice as high as previous it's actually three times higher than than february the comparator month before COVID. um so there you go um all right next slide all right and i'll hand it over for the next piece and i'll see you guys at the end in the question period hey everyone uh i'm going to talk a little bit about the navigation apps first and then i'll talk about the system mapping platform uh, definitely related to each other, but they're, they're different parts. Um, so kind of first that, that downloadable app in iOS, Android, as well as on desktop at helpseeker.org. And that's that front facing piece where people looking for the supports uh, can go find it. So no sign in required. And this is, this has been really important for us is, is we don't want that information. So I know it, it could be potentially helpful. Um, but we don't want to know that it was Johnny, who's a 38 year old man that lives in downtown Toronto, who's looking for support with addictions, this, 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 so on and so forth. So that's not the level of data that we're collecting. Rather, we're able to see that somebody went into there into the system. Uh, they clicked on mail, they clicked on addictions, and, and it was in Toronto. So that, that's the level of uh, data that we have, and so that's that no sign-in required. It also allows people to freely go in there and search for this, the supports they're needing. So what supports are we actually collecting and mapping? Uh, services, programs, phone lines and benefits, and these, these phone lines and benefits have been for us the really big um, eye opener in the last same month here is there's tons and tons of new phone lines coming online, uh, as well as the benefits, as we all know, is there's lots of benefits coming out at a city level, provincial level and national level. And so we're benef uh, sorry, we're, we're mapping all of those so that people can actually find those supports. So you're able to search by a category um, through the name of the listing. If you were to actually know that indeed you're looking for say YWCA or CMHA or something like that, or if you're looking say in Toronto versus uh, outside of Toronto, if you're looking over into Hastings County or something of that nature, you're able to search those different areas. So we leverage uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning into our system, and that's been a recent uh, add-on into our system to, to really develop out that search bar. So that's been in place for a few months now. And basically what's happening is we're now starting to understand what people are actually looking for in the system. And, and if you know anything about artificial intelligence, the more it gets used, the more it understands, the, the more predictive it gets. So as time goes on, our apps will get stronger and stronger and be able to um, understand what people are looking for and then recommend better um, listings for them. So filtering, I'm going to leave that. So currently we're working in over 200 communities across Canada. Um, unfortunately, some of those have been added on in the last little bit. And I say unfortunate because I know it's directly to do with COVID that we've had such an insane strong response where more and more communities keep jumping on and, and starting to map and getting involved. So uh, we're happy to announce that as of May 1st, we'll have the apps and desktop available in uh, French plus the 22 uh, most commonly spoken languages. And I really should have wrote that in there, which ones they are. But if you go uh, top languages uh, spoken in Canada, you'll find them right away. So we're in the process of developing those out and uh, all is looking good. And as long as there's no massive bumps in it, it'll be available for the end of next week. So that's exciting, super exciting for us. 
So that on the one hand was the front facing, so people looking for help. Um, now on the back end, this is where it's really interesting for us as, as, a, as a research group, is we're looking at how do we get this information pulled together for communities so they understand what's actually happening in real time. And, and Alina spoke a lot about that systems mapping platform. And that's that data curation, data collection curation, and then getting it out into a useful manner into the people that can make those decisions in real time. So if you're at that city decision level maker uh, level, uh, what is it that you need to know that's happening? So, you know, week one was housing and food, uh, and now week two, three, we're seeing spikes in, in abuse and mental health and addiction. So what does that tell us about the ever-changing uh, dynamics of what's going on with COVID? So that's, that's this piece. Um, heat maps have been a really important one for us to be able to visualize what we're seeing. So that's built again right into that back end of the system and I'm going to show you an example of this. So this is down in Lethbridge and what we saw is here was the heat maps pre-COVID. So that was all the people clicking on the system. We're able to see, okay, good portion of the people are, are searching right downtown. Um, and then during COVID, all the interactions, so same thing, interactions, people clicking in within our, our apps, within our uh, mapping platform. And then you can see that that same week, majority of people were actually looking for COVID related supports. So it's again, that ever changing dynamics of what's happening within the community. And that, that visualization of the data is so crucial. So Alberta-wide data, I'm just going to kind of flip through these fairly quickly because, again, I do want to make sure we have enough time uh, for Nicole to be showing you around the system what it looks for mapping. Um, but we, we started very much in, in Alberta, so we're a Calgary-based company, uh, and then we started kind of southern uh, Alberta, and then we've been kind of expanding from there outward. So it, it was Alberta-based, but we've grown quickly throughout, throughout Canada. So 18 plus cities in, in Alberta. And so I'm gonna go through a little bit of the data here. So this is from March 20th till the 14th, so just about a month. Uh, 68,000 interactions. So this, again, same thing nationally. Uh, we're seeing the same thing provincially. Is, is there's just been a tremendous amount of people looking for these supports. We know that people are online. They're trying to figure out where to go, how to find the help. So 18% of them, so the most interactions were COVID-related. Um, again, a bunch of other data in here. I'm not going to sit and read through them. Uh, basic needs was kind of the top thing that people were looking for. So again, kind of not breaking it down to those real specific pieces like uh, domestic violence, uh, rather kind of keeping it broader. So basic needs is the main one. Need interactions by categories. So here's the breakdown of it by categories. So obviously the emergency disaster, that's that COVID reliefs uh, piece. And that's again, majority of what people are looking for. Can't emphasize that enough that people are in absolute dire need of being able to figure out what's actually operating because we know what was operating last week is not operating this week or what is this week is now closed. Or again, they're, they're switching how they're doing things. So that up to date real time of what's happening is absolutely crucial. So this is breakdown by population. And again, I'm not going to go through all these, but this is the kind of data that we're now able to, to collect and able to see and able to get out to uh, the decision makers, including you folks there, is going, okay, people are looking for these sorts of supports. Uh, you know, adults are looking for this, children are looking for this. And so it's that sort of data that we're able to collect. So... What are the actual benefits for you guys as a service provider? So again, assuming that you're a service provider, um, what is in, in this for you? So you're able to actually in real time create an account, and this is what Nicole's gonna do, create an account and add all your programs, your locations, edit them, uh, do the descriptions, fill out the categories. And again, right now, 
this is so crucial because these things are changing. While the eligibility criteria might have been this uh, last week, today it's now changed to this, where we were only serving youth between the ages of X and Z, it's now that we're having children and youth or all the way up to 30 years old. So that is really important is this real time component of it. So, um, connect with people that are looking for the help. So that up-to-date listing, it's, it's also that free advertising. I know some of you guys are so swamped to begin with and so free advertising might not be a good thing, but rather you're connecting with the, the people that need the help. So the right people that need your help that you're able to provide. So very similar to what I just said with the second one. And then agencies with active listings on help seeker help inform decision makers uh, around their needs of programming. So if, if we look at all the different components, we go, okay, if we have all of these services in here and we understand folks that say at the city level, provincial level, whatever that funder type level is, is they're able to go, hey, that's amazing that we now have all of our food services, and this is what we're seeing through a lot of cities, is we're, we're able to mobilize, say, food services, but what are we now doing for mental health? And what are those other gaps that are in our system? Everything's, all the doors are closed, so what's actually available? Um, so if you're wanting to get involved, the big things that we're seeing is, is that sign up. We're, we're absolutely swamped with sign ups on a regular basis now. Uh, spread the word. This, the word of mouth has been the most powerful tool, absolutely. Download the apps, take a look at them, see what you think. Uh, we always are looking for feedback. That's how we got to this, this place in the less than, well, just over two years now, uh, is by taking that feedback and, and growing with it. Social media is, is a huge one. So those social channels were on all the major ones and any of those marketing materials, which of course would be most likely digital currently. But if you're looking for those, you can reach out to us as well. So that's it for my part and I'll return at the end and be able to answer any questions. We're going to do a little swap over here where we're going to switch screens um, and hopefully it will work to have Nicole take over the screen. Are we good, Nicole? Your mic's not on still as well. Okay. Mic's on. We also have a plan B where we have some of the slide captures just in case because as I'm sure we're, we're all aware we're, uh, the internet's not the greatest in these times. Um, I am very sorry. I'm not seeming to be able to share my screen and I'm not quite sure why. Just one second. Okay. Perfect. Can you everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. Just get rid of this here. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Nicole. I'm a systems mapping coordinator with HelpSeeker. Um, I work with a team uh, to get all those listings into HelpSeeker as well with communities to kind of ensure that they're uh, listed well. I also provide tech and help desk support to um, to service providers that, that may need it. Um, I was going to divide up today into kind of three parts and just briefly show you you know, from as an agency, how to sign up, how to get your listings um, in there, how to claim listings that might already be in there, as well as walk you through kind of the main platform. And then lastly, we'll just log in as an agency through the back end and just show, uh, kind of demonstrate how to add listings or edit listings um, from there. So from the main site, you'll, you'll come to this kind of home screen. And from here, we have a couple different options here. If we were a client looking for help, we could directly find that help from one of these buttons here in the front. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If you would like to, if you're a service provider and you want to make sure that you um, are included in our map, um, up here in the top right corner, there's a button called join us. If we click on this. This is how we request a free account. It's going to open a screen 
it's going to look exactly like this. Here's where you fill out your information, you know, first name, last name, agency information. I've created this as a test account. Once all your information is uh, filled out correctly, uh, you just click this button, it'll be illuminated. And it'll allow you that has requested an account. Um, from there, what will happen is you'll receive an email confirmation. This will give you your email login and just let you know that or give you instructions on how to log in. Uh, we're going to go back to this and what this is going to do and, and how to access the back end from here. But I'm just going to show you a little bit about how to access the platform for, as a service provider from your computer. Um, so again, we'll be back to the home screen here. We can enter a couple ways. Find Corona Help um, is one great way to enter the site. You can also enter it just by finding General Help. We'll click on the orange button. You're going to get a prompt right away about which city that you're you're in. Now, because we are a location or a location um, platform, if you were to use the app, chances are your location would already be enabled, and it's just going to bring you right to that screen. But because we are on a computer, and there's a variety of reasons why our computer wouldn't allow our location to be detected, uh, from anything from firewalls to uh, prefer personal preference, uh, we're just going to tell our city where we're looking in. And just for today's kind of demo, I'm just going to um, take a look at Lethbridge. Click on Lethbridge. Um, we're going to click find help here. What it's going to do um, is it's going to just tag COVID up here and we're able to remove that later. If we would have clicked no, it, it, we would have, this tag would have not been selected. Now all of our searches will be now in Lethbridge. So our searches work, our search bar up here, which I heard Travis talk about earlier, does a number of things. Um, the first thing it does is it, if you identify a need and you type it in, it'll help locate it. So for example, if I was to write in, I'm hungry, into the search bar and click enter, it's automatically gonna take food. I'm just gonna X out this because we're not interested in this right now. Um, at the top, you can see there's 103 listings and they have all been tagged food. So you can scroll through, you can find a, um, you can find a, a service or an agency that looks that looks like it's going to provide the service that you need. Once you open up a listing, you can take a look and it has a variety of different fields. Um, owner, this identifies you know if the listing's been claimed or not. That's a really good indicator if the information is up to date, if it's accurate, if it's being checked regularly, as well as a number of other fields um, on the app as well as on the de desktop. These are all going to link you directly to an email or to the website, as well as if you have the function right to the phone. On the app, it's definitely going to start to call it um, from a phone, as well as we have um, a short helpful description on what it's there. Um, there is a number of fields here, hours and stuff. We'll talk about that when we look at the back end because there's a lot of optional fields that you can fill out. And I can see that some of them haven't been filled out. So rather than them being left blank, they just, they just don't show up, which keeps it uh, really nice and handy. Another function of the search bar is if we were to take off, um, take off I'm hungry and we wanted to search for an agency name, we knew what we were looking for, we could also do that. So I took a look this morning and I know that we have an agency in here called uh, Lethbridge Shelter. Um, and I can see it pops up here. So your listings are gonna generate, if there's a little icon of a house here, this is gonna be a listing that we can find. When you see a map pin here, this is gonna change our location. Um, so if we just click on here, we're gonna notice that um, our listing came up and we can also search for it directly by name. So we knew what the name was called, it's gonna pop up here. Um, I wasn't going to talk about this extra field, but we're here now, so let's talk about it. There is an additional field here. I noticed that it's a shelter. Um, so we have a space occupancy, and it says here um, 80 beds. It wasn't on the last listing that I showed you. It also has a date stamp. That's really interesting when we look at the back end of what that means. So um, this means that this is the last time these spaces have up been updated for this listing. So not the whole listing has been updated, just the bed spaces. Um, the other thing the search bar can do is if you also identify um, a category that you're looking for, so perhaps you are looking for just that shelter and you click enter, it is going to bring us a list of um, 
a list of shelters and they're going to be located here. So this is how the search bar, the smart search bar works. Um, as well as we have an advanced search bar. So what this does is it opens a number of categories and you can also select this way. This is probably the way most people are searching and I'll just show you how you would use, how would you would use this category search rather than the search bar. So if we were to select a number of categories and I'm going to select COVID because I know there's quite a few out there and food. I'm going to click search. Uh, now what's happened is we've gotten two tags, COVID and food, and that's what we call them here as tags. And it's going to generate a list of listings that's hit both of those matches. So at the top, we can kind of see that they're bolded. These are going to be the most relevant to what we've searched for. So both of these have hit both two out of two matches. So they're both COVID and food. If we continue to scroll down, we're going to notice that um, they're going to start to become unbolded and what that's going to tell us is that they're only going to hit one out of two matches oh right here so they're not bolded anymore um which is kind of a neat function so the ones that are going to hit the top are going to be the most relevant and then when you look down the list you're going to find ones that hit uh just maybe one or or more of your tags but not all of them uh our our listings are divided into three categories so our listings where we are right now and you can see it up at the top our, our agencies and our program, our program level services that we offer. And then if you um, click here under helplines, I'm just going to X this out here. Helplines are not only the kids phone lines that you would expect, they're also going to be those online chat lines as well as interactive, um, interactive supports and different stuff like that would all be classified as a helpline. And benefits again at the top, benefits are typically financial in nature and they're going to be things like your child tax credit i can see canada disabilities um, savings savings bonds and but typically they're going to be financial in nature there's also going to be things in there like shaw free wi-fi again because it's kind of like a financial benefit i'm going to go back here to listings i just want to point out that there's we can see here that for lethbridge we have 1639 listings now, once we start to search for certain things, that's gonna drastically drop. So if we're gonna search for COVID, just show you this quickly, we're gonna see there's 201 offers for COVID. Um, and then that's how it's searched. As well as the last kind of neat thing about how we search is we can search in a variety of ways. So tag matches is probably the most common and most way to find those relevant services to what you're looking for. As well as we can see here that we can search alphabetically. Um, grayed out on mine is closest. And this is just because I don't have my location enabled. So this is gonna be common for a lot of computer desktops, not all of them, but on an app you would be able to click this it's going to show you bring up a map of all those services closest to you first which is which is pretty pretty neat um another function here i'm just going to close this out that i didn't hear travis talk about so i'll just mention it on the far right hand side we also have a bulletin board this is fairly new and this is specific to covid um, if you were to search for an a community or a city that you're interested in. So again, I'm going to put Lethbridge in here just to show you, just to show you the bulletin. Hit confirm. These are updated every day. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us a directory. It's going to pop up here in a second. Um, a directory of listings that offer COVID support. Um, they're going to be organized in alphabetical order. And this is a great kind of, it's, it's able to be printed and it's available for those that may not have access um, to computers all the time. So from there, um, to use the platform, I just also, last thing here is at the bottom here, we have three buttons, join as an agency. This would be very similar to that first button that I showed you when we go up to the top right-hand corner and we hit join as an agency, it's gonna bring you to that, um, that new page with those fields there, um, and then agency sign-in. So agency sign is once you've received your password, this is, this is one way you can enter as well as you can enter from that main screen on the top um, right corner. So we'll enter that now. So this is from, from the back end. Um, as well as we just did all that navigation and we just kind of searched for, searched for a few listings just to see how it worked and there was no sign up required. We didn't have to give any information. We didn't have to offer our email address and that's really important. Um, so from here, we hit the sign-in page. It's going to bring up this page. Here's where you're going to enter your information. 
and um, click login. This is going to bring you to your listings. Now this is set up as a test site, so it looks a little bit strange, um, but it's going to similarly bring you up a map with the listings that you have. When you request, when you request a account, sorry, you're already going to have those listings attached to your account. So when you go to the left hand side, and you click on this menu bar listing, it'll bring down a drop down menu, click on all listings. It's going to show you what you already have mapped or what you're claiming. So if we already have you in Help Seeker and you just want to claim those listings, um, something similar to this is going to show up. From here, we're able to do a number of things. We can edit our listing. I'm going to briefly just uh, show us how to do that. As well as on the left hand side, we can also add a new listing. Let's do that now. Um, at the top of the page, we have two options, location and program. Location is typically going to be that agency um, or, or the building that it belongs to. So like a, a larger one, perhaps like the, the YWCA. And then your programs are going to be the services or programs run out of that. So whether it's a food program, counseling program, um, those are going to be your programs. There's going to be some fields that have asterisks. They're mandatory fields and the rest are going to be optional. So I'm going to go ahead and fill this out here. So we're able to um, save it. Um, eligibility is an optional field. If you, when we went to that first listing and we took a look and we could see hours and, and different fields filled out, um, this would have been one of them if it was filled out. If it's left blank, it just nearly comes up empty. But of course, if you have the information, it's very helpful. So, so do include it. So here we could add anything from, you know, adults, adults we could add, you must be referred. Um, there's a number of things we can use this eligibility eligibility criteria for. I pointed out when we were on kind of that main public site that we had an opportunity to to take a look at spaces. So here is where you'd have um, you'd specify that if you had a shelter with with limited amount of beds here you could um, oh here you could enter that information here you have 100 beds and there is and there is four available. Once you fill out this as soon as these numbers are filled out that's what gives you that timestamp. So that timestamp isn't for the last time your entire listing was updated, just your space occupancy is listed. Um, here as well, you can specify if it's if you're looking for beds, mats, um, spaces, caseloads. Um, there's a number of things you could enter there. Um, here we can see again, these are all, they don't have asterisks, so they're all optional fields. Of course, when people find your listing, they need a way to connect to you. So um, definitely emails. It, any, any of these fields to fill out is fantastic, but um, if you have email, that's very handy, as well as a website. Here is a mandatory field with the asterisks here, and this is a little bit interesting. It's a map function. So what happens because we're a location um, platform, it's really important that we're showing, um, we're showing listings in your area. So we need to put a map in the pin. And how we use this map is there's two lines here. The top line says address clarification, and the bottom one is find address by the map. So here we're going to type in an address. And just off the top of my head, I'm going to kind of one, two, three, Parkway Forest looks good. Um, it's going to start to pop. It's a Google map. So it's going to start to populate um, suggestions. So you're going to scroll down. You're going to find which one is, is yours. If you need to type more to kind of expand or or um, reduce the list, you can do so. I'm just going to pick this one here. You notice that now a pin has appeared in the map and my address has jumped up jumped up a line. So now from here we can edit it. Now we can do a couple different things. If this is our address and we're fine with it, we can move on. Um, something that's commonly happening, especially with COVID, is that we're seeing a lot of outreach pop up. So different kind of vans and things that don't have specific locations or they're just not taking those face to face. There's also a number of other um, a number of other reasons why you just might want, not want your pin in the map to identify your location. Um, and, and that's fine. So we're able to grab this pin and we're able to move it to where we want on the map. Perhaps we have an outreach and the van sits on the corner of this street and they're going to be there every Tuesday. We can just move our map there. Once we move our map and we've dragged it to where we want it, and this address has popped up to this top line, we can then edit it. So we could write something like, um, you know, this is an outreach service. No address provided. 
that's fine. No address is going to show up and our map is going to let clients and those users know that there is no address there. Please do not walk to this location. Or maybe you want to specify, you know, we meet at the park every Tuesday at nine. You, you could do that as well. Um, that is a mandatory field. So you'll need to put something there. The pin has to go in the map. Um, from down here, we do have an, as a service provider, you're able to add an image, just kind of adds a little bit of stuff. It's, it's fairly straightforward, but I did pull one just so I could show you. You're just going to click on here. You're going to go to your photos. I pulled one. Oh, and we're going to hit apply. It showed up rather big in the screen. And there's our photos. Uh, we can remove it. Your cover image is going to be the one that's going to show up on that main page of the listing. Once they open it up, they can scroll through a number of these photos. You're able to add, I believe, six or more photos um, down here, and you would just add them as images. If your image is an uh, awkward shape or it's kind of a banner, you might have to crop it first in order for it to show up and display properly. But um, and if anybody has any problems, they can reach out and I'm happy to help with that. Again, these are optional fields. This gives you an option to specify, you know, if you're not for profit, if you're volunteer, that, that field here is not available to the public, whether you fill it out or not. Nobody has access to that. Hours they do. We have a character limit of 60, so sometimes you have to be a little bit creative. Um, and here is the last mandatory field for this first set, and it's your description. So here we can just add a helpful description. Um, you can add up to a thousand words. So we're kind of looking for a short, short kind of synopsis of what, what, you de what your um, agency provides and kind of written in language that is understandable for most. So not a lot of academic language. We just want it pretty plain. From here, you'll see that your listing here, create listing button is going to be illuminated. If you click on it, your listing is now um, save the top part. It's also going to open up a number of fields below. One of them is going to be this category tags. And when we were on that public site, that is how we were searching in the advanced search, as well as um, when we asked for COVID support, we were searching tags. So from here, we're kind of saying at minimum, you want a population focus. So um, perhaps you would want adults and you would want a service or a need. Um, so perhaps you, you need clothing support or counseling support. You can, cl you can click as many as you want, but we're kind of saying at minimum, you want a population and you want um, a service or a need. As well, here is the area that if you have a COVID support you're offering, your agency is offering, you would also take COVID. This is what triggers um, your listing to be part of the bulletin, is if you have a COVID update. So if you add that there, um, here at the bottom is um, this this information as well is not available to the public so this is an optional field and you can fill it out from there we're just going to hit save our listing now has become um live so right from here i think it's probably going to be added at the bottom our listing can be edited we can add pictures we can do a number of things from the time that you hit save it's going to take up to an hour for it to or about an hour for it to come to the public site if you already have a listing in you can edit it and those and those edits are going to become live right away if you add a picture again you're going to have to wait um I, I believe it updates at the top of every hour and then you'll be able to see it on the public site from here when you see all your listings you're typically going to have listings already when you ask when you request an account so you're also able to go in there and just edit them so if we wanted to go in here and edit our our shelter um, we could go ahead, you know, there's, there's some social distancing happening. Maybe they're only offering 50 beds and there's, and there's 10 available now. This is now going to update to today's date. So we're going to know that this beds have been updated today and they are, and they are accurate. Um, and then again, at the bottom, once you've made all your corrections, you're just going to go down to the bottom and you're going to click save. And that is that is how we um, yeah edit and make corrections. I'm just going to add one one little note that I that I realized I left off. For COVID, we're asking that you update your you update your listing to represent what you're doing, whether you're closed or not. So, for example, when we're talking to service providers and they're saying, you know, we're we're temporarily suspended, that would be a really good note to kind of add um, just for users that are going to search for it. You know programs are temporarily suspended we're going to put that on there and that way 
when people are looking for it, they know, you know, this is probably going to be a closed door. We're going to, we're going to look elsewhere. We're going to phone and inquire um, before we just show up. Um, if you were to, if your program is closed, I would say do not tag it COVID because we don't want it to show up on a listing as an available resource. Um, however, if you are open and you're still business as usual or you're providing, you know, supports and just maybe delivering them in a different way, absolutely tag it COVID, add a little update, you know, no face to face, we're taking telephone um inquiries only or, or what have you and then at the bottom we're just going to click save and our listing is going to be updated and that's about it and if anybody has any questions there's a couple different ways that you can reach kind of tech support in the help desk one is through our main page so if you go to contact us um, it's going to link to info at helpseeker.org and I'm able to kind of provide these instructions. I can email them to you. I'm also able to take a telephone call and walk you through um, some of the some of the functions that happen or some of the edits just to make sure that it's um, that it's working good for you. And that's my tutorial about kind of help seeker and how to get your listings up there. And I'll pass it on to Travis. Thank you, Jenny. Was there any questions that people were having? Yeah, you bet. Um, there were a few here. So Patrick Stewart, uh, he has, his question was, where does housing need fall in the top needs? Yeah, so I actually, I answered that. So it was absolutely within the top 10. It just, uh, it just, we only showed you guys the top five. So I believe it was in the um, number seven, um, seven, eight. Oh, I'm glad you're back there, Travis, because it was my picture and it said <laughs> you were Alina Turner. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely still a top issue. The interesting thing and what we wanted to point out is that these, these uh, trends are changing all the time. So you need to kind of keep your eye out on okay, what, are, what are people um, needing this week versus last week and what's the story the data is telling us in, in relation to what else we know is, is happening so it kind of makes sense that mental health and addictions are going to pop up higher because we've you know we've been in isolation longer um and i believe last time there was it was also close to the end of the month beginning of the month when rent was due so it, it made sense um that we saw more pressure on on these basic needs back um a couple weeks ago. The last time we did the webinar, I should say. Okay, great. Um, so the next question that we've got is from Tina, Tina Ezekiel. Hi, Tina. On the top five issues, can you explain the difference between abuse and domestic abuse? Yeah, sure. So we have the terms domestic violence and abuse as two distinct tags. Now, a program could could say that they're doing both, right? Um, domestic violence, and and again, this these are loaded terms, as you uh, can imagine. There's also the term family violence. We we went with domestic violence because we're we're from Alberta, and domestic violence seems to be the kind of most accepted, most common term for services supporting. Um, folks that have ex experienced uh, violence within the context of the domestic realm. So that's usually uh, to do with the household. It's happening um, in the home, so to speak. So usually it's, uh, it might be interpersonal violence among spouses or partners. It, um, it might be um, abuse of, of the child within, uh, within the home, et cetera. So we're, we're absolutely aware of that angle. And at the same time, we were also called out on only having domestic violence when we started out by folks that provide services for um, for people who are experiencing abuse outside of the home as well. Now, there could be um, a child that might be experiencing abuse in in the context of their peer group, or um, you know, with family members that are not necessarily in in the in their domestic context. So uh, that's why we included the abuse um, option for services to tag themselves like that. But essentially what we do is we kind of provide these tags based on your guys' feedback and what we're seeing when we do the mapping process. So they're they're always um, open for kind of um, for thinking through better ways of, of, of taxonomizing this stuff. And with COVID, for instance, that didn't exist until 
you know, last week or <laughs> last month, I should say. So um, these, the taxonomy we believe needs to be dynamic because the system itself is, is quite dynamic. Yet there are cer certain things that are con pretty consistent, but we also have to be open to uh, new pieces coming on. So in fact, one of the things that's going to be coming out next week is around um, arts and recreation. So a uh, Kind of more categories around that because we're we've got some feedback that, uh, for instance, therapy that are art based, art based, art based counseling and therapies that weren't able to adequately demonstrate that that focus. Um, there was also kind of play based work that wasn't adequately captured in the counseling tab, so to speak. So, um, you know, we're always listening. And if you guys have other ideas or if there's terms that are not there, by all means. The other piece that's that's really critical, and my colleagues can jump in, is that natural language. So the way we talk about it as systems people or service providers versus how people looking for help talk about it is very, very different. So I'm, you know, I might be a, oh, I'm a, uh, I'm going to look for services for a, uh, a woman who is a refugee and is in this age bracket because, because I know that's how this, the system is structured. Um, but if I, that might not be how, how people self identify, I, I might just go into the system and say, I'm scared, right? Or I'm, I'm, am I drinking too much? Right. So that's why that search bar that they were showing you guys is really important because we can see um, when somebody looks for assistance, how they talk about it, how they express it. And then our algorithm um, learns from that and becomes better and better at making suggestions of services that match those terms. So I might say, again, I'm scared. And so the algorithm would learn over time that when that woman or, or man or child ends up clicking on domestic violence services, next time somebody else comes in and says, I'm scared, it learns to make those types of suggestions because it, it, it kind of, anyways, it's just how machine learning works in a really junky way of explaining it and a non-technical way of explaining it. So uh, Netflix does this too when it suggests things you might be interested in. That's, that's what we're, we're doing as well. Uh, and Tina just had a follow-up comment about, um, you know, differentiating between abuse and domestic violence. She just said, you know, if someone asks for a distinction, um, she would just suggest a better blurb or information so that those reviewing the material can clearly understand. So Good idea. Good idea. So um, a blurb about um, on the tags is what you're saying so that you know which tag you should, you should be using. It's a great idea. Uh, the next uh, question relates to our translation, our upcoming translation component. Uh, it's from Patrick Stewart again, and he asks, what about Indigenous languages? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the, the, indigen or the Indigenous languages are definitely on our radar. Um, so in our first iteration, we wanted to, um, well, not, not that we wanted to, but we have a partnership with a newcomer serving sector. And so um, that's where that, that came in. We, we don't tend to do things by ourselves. We tend to partner with organizations. So um, it was the settlement sector that approached us to, uh, to work together and collaborate on these uh, 22 top languages. But you know, as you know, um, and as you can imagine, indigenous languages are, are definitely on, on the radar because that's folks are, are looking for supports um, at a disproportionate rate from uh, those vulnerable you know, in the Indigenous communities as well. So it would definitely be on our radar. If you guys have uh, connections with Indigenous organizations that are looking to, to partner on something like this, that would be awesome. We, um, had, we recruited translators for the newcomer uh, uh, kind of project as well. But yeah, we don't want to do something that's, especially around Indigenous work, that is not done in partnership with. So we just haven't had the opportunity, but from a tech perspective, everything is doable and it's definitely on our wish list to do this as well. So yeah, get in touch with myself or Travis if you have ideas on this. 
Uh, our next question is from Warren McFadder. Uh, Warren says, I work in the employment field helping individuals with intellectual disabilities find and secure employment. Uh, one of our services is a one-to-one -one job coaching, but since the COVID-19, that service has been suspended. If there were a way were a way a coach may be able to demonstrate virtually or be able to view the tasks the participant is doing on the job virtual in real time. Is this a possibility with the app? Yeah. So our app is about um, mapping services and then uh, making that information accessible to end users. So you could absolutely have your service done virtually and then in your, and then Nicole, you can chime in here, but essentially you would just make that um, note that the service is available virtually and and what the participant uh, tech requirements would be to be able to connect with you. So I'm, you know, presumably the, the client would need to have access to a phone and internet to be able to connect with you. And then you could put in, you know, how, how would they get in touch with you? Probably email and phone. You could also think about um, extending your hours of operation and the regional catchment area. So if you if you're not as busy with kind of the day to day clients and you're able to expand the service to do virtual coaching, then you can definitely make that available through through your listing. Um, now, your question might be, you know, does Help Seeker have video conferencing? And no, we don't have that. And that's because there's tons of software out there including Zoom for better or worse, but there's Microsoft Teams, there's, you know, FaceTime, whatever, you know, right? Like the client and you prefer so that you can connect with them through those video conferencing pieces. Okay, great. Um, so this next question really I can answer. So Warren McFadder asked again, will we be receiving information about this technology and the slides? And yes, you bet, Warren, I will. Uh, send a recording of this webinar out as well as the slides um, in, probably in the next day or so. So the next question is from Susan Kent Coonan. Um, Susan asks, what's the difference between Help Seeker and 211? Oh yeah, so um, I think that the similarity probably comes because they do information and referral um, and and this is obviously information and referral as way as well. So our, I guess our um, sector has a number of these uh, information and referral uh, services available. Uh, there's about 300 helplines all across Canada. So for us, we aggregate everything. We take everything in, including 211, uh, but also the kids helpline or the mental health distress line, whatever these, these various helplines are, we take them all in. So uh, an analogy might be the difference between Expedia kind of takes everything in and gives you kind of the, the price, the curation of that data um, versus going to WestJet or Air Canada where they have aspects of, of the services. So uh, they might have only nonprofits or, and charities or they might have only mental health or only youth. So for us, we take everything as broadly as possible as long as it advances the social good and does frontline delivery, we map it. That's kind of our... Are to do so you'll find in our services for instance private sector that is doing pro bono legal work right now or uh, businesses that have, are doing discounts for a vulnerable populations or home delivery to isolated seniors we take all of that that in um, so they don't have to be charities or, or nonprofits. we have a, a process to to include civil society more broadly so that would be kind of the initial um, differentiation. The other one is that um, Help Seeker itself is a is a social enterprise that focuses on systems change. So we're, we're not a service, you know, we don't do crisis line, right, like the two on one guys do. They that's their, their business model. That's, that's what they do really well, you know, by all, by all means that we absolutely need that. So we do work around systems transformation. Part of that is to understand how the system functions and that's why we map it right but rather than just mapping it and doing what we do with um, funders and government and saying here's areas where we can do a better job coordinating or here's areas where we have major gaps in services right that's our core work um, we said let's not 
hold on to this amazing data that we're mapping. Let's turn it into something that's free, that's anonymous for people that are looking for assistance because by far that's been the biggest uh, thing that we have learned in our research is people still don't know where to go for help and there isn't this kind of way of aggregating all of these disparate data sets into something that's more agile and, and responsive. So hopefully that, that gave you a little bit of a sense. Um, go to helpseeker.co, that's our um, kind of uh, site that talks about what what else we do. The .org is really our just a platform. That's like one out of 15 things we're up to. So we, you know, we're active in, in the technology and research space quite a bit and, um, and even strategy consulting and things like that. So uh, you'll get a sense, a better sense of, of um, our work in other communities and, and around systems change that might be really interesting for, for you guys to take a look at too, if, if that's your cup of tea. Um, Nicole Gravel asks, is there a way to hide your tracks if a woman is seeking information or supports for domestic violence on the website? Great idea. I'll let Travis take that yeah. one. For that one, that one's in next up in the hopper for development. So uh, again, basically what we do for our development is as communities are continuing to work with us, starting to work with us, we go, okay, so what is it that you need in our system to make it useful and, and the right thing for you guys? And so we recently just started working with uh, two, so provincially with Alberta, as well as Manitoba with their domestic violence sector. And both of them have recently stated, you know, this is something Thing that's really important for us um, and so it'll be you know I, I don't want to give exact timelines but within the next month for sure we'll have the cover the tracks button so the quickly exit I know exactly what you're speaking of with that with that question so yeah it's 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 in its in the works yeah okay great um, so Gord Friesen asks if your service is offered over an area how do you mark each community even if you don't have an address I think maybe uh, Gord, I wonder if instead of community, if you meant uh, program. Uh, Nicole, is that something that you want to take over? Take sure, over? absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it is common. There is there is a few different things. So when we map, um, if it's a helpline or a benefit, we can identify an entire region, province, or even the entire Canada and include those. Um, when we're when we're mapping locations and programs, there's a, there's a couple of ways we can do it. So, like I said, we want that pin to show up in your community, so it shows up for for that. So we could either, you know, if it's if it's a program that's offered in many different cities across Canada or across the province, we can map them, those each as individual services, uh, as locations or listings, and that way they're showing up for for each. Um, and that probably would be the the best way the best way at the moment to do it. Um, if we have something like, for example, this has come up in Ontario a little bit, they have um, benefits that apply to, you know, three quarters of the province, but not all the province. So we would map their entire province, um, specify that region, and then that's where we'd use that eligibility criteria and specify this is for such and such county to such and such county and kind of just exclude the ones that it is not available. I hope that helped. Sorry, one second here. <laughs> um, so thanks, thanks, Nicole. Uh, Leanne Stark asks, uh, can you email me some publications uh, that can share with other service providers in our area to ensure we can accurately demonstrate the services available to individuals in our com community? Thanks. And yes, absolutely, I can email you some uh, resources, Leanne. Thank you so much. Uh, Tazio Clark asks, I came on a little late. How do I download this app on my desktop? So, so oh, go ahead, Travis, you take it. I, I can answer that one. Um, it's available in iOS and Android. So that's through the app stores. Uh, so Google Play and then Apple. So that, that's for that one. It, it's not a downloadable app on desktop. Uh, rather, I didn't know that Microsoft does have that. Rather, it's, it's just www.helpseeker.org. And then you can click in from there and actually access it. And then it's, it's, it's mobile as well. So um, you can pull it up on your phone and it's, it's a mobile um, app yeah. without having to download it. So. Yeah. Great. The, question, the next question is, how did you initially gather all of this data? My organization appears on your website, but I'm not sure anybody was contacted to provide this information. Yeah, go for it. Oh, uh, Nicole, do you want to talk about, or Travis? 
so basically what it is is it's it's through a whole bunch of different data sets and Alina spoke about this is that often in a community when we go to start working with them it's you know there's a data set here there's a data set here there's a data set here um, I always like to give the example of, of Abbotsford because I, I swear there must have been about 15 20 of them anywhere from stuff written from five years ago on on pieces of paper that they would fax over to us um to you know all these random different data sets one for youth one for children one for seniors so it, it's a matter of taking all those different data sets compiling them in the system and getting them getting them into that spot as well as then just our own research within a community so that's um that's that uh there's also some national data sets so it depends on what community you're in some national open data sets that we had uh or we had have um kind of over the last few years that we've used to to start as that uh, as our starting spot if you will mm -hmm. yeah and then nicole do you want to describe the process in, in a community where you guys do the systems mapping using open data and then you uh, engage the service providers to take over their profiles? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when we uh, originally and initially work with that community, we will, we will be provided oftentimes public directories of places that they, they would like listed. So, and they are publicly found as well as we'll go through a community and take a look at what's, what's available for them and include them on the map as well as um, when we do update and send and map new communities, oftentimes we'll also send an email to that listing that's available on their website to just let them know, here's a link, this is what we have, can you please check it for accuracy? Would you like to kind of take ownership of this to, you know, to just ensure that that information that's getting out there is accurate, it's, it's bringing them back to their website, their sources of information. Great. Thank you. Um, and Deborah Miville asks, is there a place in the listing for an organization to list the languages spoken? Travis? Yeah, we, we don't have it listed anywhere, but uh, as soon as it's made available, we'll, we'll put it, you know, kind of front and center on now uh, on our website. So um, I'm going to write that down actually as a, as a to do, because it, it should have actually been in there what, what languages. But when you actually pull it up, you'll be able to search uh, and you'll see that here's the, the 2023 20, languages that it's available in within the app. So uh, you'll just be able to pull it up, but I'll, I'll make an announcement. Social media will have it uh, as well as then on our main website. Okay. So well, as we do, we do have a language tag and often we'll see in the description of places they'll say, you know, offering services in a variety of languages and they'll list them. That is what we have. Yeah. Uh, okay. And Michelle Nichol asks, um, well, she said she made a comment that she was unable to access the password reset. How long should this take? And she also asked, how long does it take to get a password once you joined? Nicole, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. So when you, from the time you request and you fill out that form, join us, um, it happens relatively quickly. I take a look to make sure that, you know, it, it's an agency. I can find it online. There's some kind of presence. It's, it's legit. We're, we're looking uh, for those agencies that provide supports, whether they're private, not for profit, but we're not really listing those, you know, local Uber drivers or the, the neighborhood babysitters. So, so there is a process to getting them up. I'd say, you know, Definitely, if you haven't heard anything by the end of that day, that uh, to reach out and contact or resubmit, um, and and that that would just be there. There's been a few occasions where um, it's not gone through the spam filter, but um, you should you should receive it fairly quickly. Password reset. If that's not working for you, please do reach out and I can reset it for you. As well as when you log in on that login page, there is a button that asks like that resets your password. It's going to take your email. And it's going to tell you that it's reset your password. If you haven't even signed up yet, it's going to look like you've gotten a password. You're just not going to receive anything and neither am I. So in order to reset the password, you need to have an account first. Mm -hmm. And it's info at helpseeker.org for Nicole. Um, uh, so Lizeth uh, Ardilla asks, is this information being updated solely by service provider organizations registered with you or is someone on your end updating this information? Do you want that one, Alina? Oh, I mean, it's both. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
it's 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 honestly all of them so it's 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 the service providers it's us it's also then um you know for instance united way in in the nimo is now starting to get involved in updating it um this is city of lethbridge the city of uh you know all these different the county of hastings so that there's different source points but there's always that training there's that quality control um and, and especially at this point where we're at where things are changing daily not one single person i'd love to tell you that we have an army of a thousand people updating these services but that's just just not the case so so we do it uh service providers do it decision makers do it or, or kind of at that level so there's all these different access points there's also that suggest listings um so that's that general public then reaches out and says Hey, this one's not operational or hey this one so it's it's all these different checks and balances so that we're keeping things up to date uh the best the best we can in this this crazy time mm -hmm. uh anonymous could you could you just grab our info from bc 211 and update it rather than having us update both uh 211 is better bc 211 is better known so if there's limited time to update things i'm trying to figure out how to prioritize you know what we would love to um what we could do is um have like permission if we have your permission to grab your bc one listing then we can absolutely maybe drop uh nicole an email for those of you that have two on one listings or or listing somewhere else wherever they might be um and you want us to kind of to take that on your behalf then uh I think probably just dropping the call and note so that we have that on file so then we can um, approach these the other resource listings and say hey can we can we have this um, can we have access to this I mean it's easy to grab for us but we just need to have like your permission to to do that so I think is that make sense Trav yep. Nicole? Yeah. Yeah. it would be the permission from from the service provider that we're yeah. allowed to take from two one one. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And then this is the last question. Uh, it's from Tina again, and it says she says, "Is there a place to indicate LGBTQ plus two S friendly?" Absolutely. There's a tag um, that you can select. Anybody else want to? No. Yeah, that's it. We do. We have a feel. Yeah. And then there's also they could fill out additional within uh, eligibility if there was specific uh, and then within description as well, because again, sometimes it'll fit here, but it doesn't quite fit here or it fits here. So we've, we've tried to make it open enough where they could record uh, in different ways um, as needed. So yeah, absolutely though. Okay. Oh, and sorry, this is, uh, there was one more last question and it's how many people from one organization can sign in? Nicole, you want that one? Sure. So each account is assigned to an email um, with one access login. So there's not multiple logins for it. So I guess it would be up to your organization if you were going to share that that email and that password and have, you know, a variety of people just keeping it up to date. But we provide one account per um, per listing. No. And that's and that's a lot just to to limit confusion. So there's not, you know, somebody's making an update, somebody's removing it. And, now there has been exceptions um for instance let's say at a city level so if the city services uh if we can make that kind of clear distinction between say recreation and social services or there's a very clear division in those really big ones um then then there is exceptions but typically you know on, on most organizations it's it's one account so that people aren't stepping on each other's toes and updating here and there so and i know what some organizations have done is they then share out their account information uh to you know there's two of them that are have access to it and they're updating on a regular basis so that would be your your decision to make if you wanted to share that information of course it's not best practice to be sharing uh, accounts and uh, passwords uh, between each other, but again, it's it's kind of your call. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, that wraps up all the questions. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today for today's webinar. Uh, as mentioned, I will be sending out the recording as well as um, the accompanying slides over the next couple of days. And uh, as Alina mentioned, if you are interested in um, 
having a look at our corporate site that lists all of our services and products, that is helpseeker.co. So H-E-L-P-S-E-E-K-E-R.co. And our um, listings page for users to find resources in their area that would be helpful for them, that is helpseeker.org. So H-E-L-P-S-E-E-K-E-R.org. Thanks, everyone. Oh, and uh, sorry, just go back. Um, we have a, the food security uh, webinar happening um, on April 30th as well. So we are gonna have folks from coast to coast presenting on food security measures during COVID. So if you're a provider interested in this piece, maybe mark your time and we'll hear from food banks and food centers that are um, working in this area. It's gonna be a really, really interesting one because food was uh, such a major spike um, at the onset of this. So, we so look forward to that. After for domestic violence as well, Elena? Yeah, so, and then in May 7th, we're gonna be working on a domestic violence one with our partners, um, our provincial partners in, in Manitoba and Alberta. So we will definitely keep you guys up to speed on, on what that one's gonna look like. And again, really, really cool stuff. Um, and then of course, finally, our contact info. Awesome. That's right. So if you have any other any questions, please feel free to contact us at any of the uh, below or the ad addresses there listed. Thanks so much, everyone. Stay well. Stay safe.